The U.S. Army is gearing up for its most comprehensive restructuring in a generation. At the center of it is a return to divisions as real combat units. This is a direct response to large-scale threats, namely Russia and China. To that end, the Army released five division templates to be implemented around 2028 to 2030. The Light, Airborne, Air Assault, Heavy, and Penetration Divisions. In this episode, we're going to cover why the Army is moving back to divisions as the main unit. Every aspect of the armored divisions, which are sort of the crown jewel of the whole reorganization, and their specific roles and rationale. The first question we must address is why the Army is moving back to divisions. During the global war on terror, the Army's focus had shifted from divisions to the smaller brigade combat teams. Divisions became modular headquarters that would control whatever brigades were operating in their specific area. For example, in 2009, Multinational Division Baghdad was led by the 1st Cavalry Division's HQ, but it had brigade combat teams or BCTs from four different divisions, plus an independent BCT. Meanwhile, two of the 1st Cavalry's own BCTs were under the 25th Infantry Division's command. This model was brigade-centric. The brigade combat teams were the largest permanently resourced combined arms units that would carry out tactical tasks. During Iraq and Afghanistan, divisions and corps were at the operational and sometimes even strategic levels of war. But for general war against an advanced state, the Army foresees division-centric operations as the way forward. Permanent divisions will act as tactical units that accomplish tasks for the corps. This is necessary for large-scale combat operations for a few reasons. There's just an enormous amount of scale that brigades can't coordinate on their own. With dispersed counterinsurgencies, the divisions can generally direct the operational environment while brigades or even battalions operate semi-autonomously very far away from each other. But when maneuvering against a larger enemy force, the tactical situation has to be closely directed by an echelon above brigade, and supporting elements have to be deployed in a way that takes into account the bigger picture. Divisions can wait the main effort, which means concentrating certain brigades at the most decisive point and giving them more resources. The core echelon is necessary for shaping the deep fight, which basically means hitting the enemy's artillery, air defense systems, electronic warfare assets, logistics, and command posts deep in the rear to give divisions the opportunity to maneuver. And then organizing those divisions on specific structures allows units to be better aligned to certain tasks. Yeah, the 1st Cavalry Division has three armored BCTs, but just having the heaviest collection of brigades on paper doesn't necessarily make it ready for a large-scale war. There needs to be the resources, training, and planning to fight in that way. But how will the Heavy and Penetration Divisions fit into this framework? To simplify it, Heavy Divisions maneuver so the enemy is forced to reveal their artillery, air defenses, and other capabilities. The Corps and Joint Force then suppress them with long-range artillery and air power, and the Pen Divisions exploit that gap. Heavy Divisions are meant to be able to maneuver independently so the enemy reacts, making them vulnerable to detection and targeting. The Army is investing heavily in missile artillery, including hypersonic missiles, to suppress these threats. This is the expressed purpose of the five future multi-domain task forces coordinated with the new theater-level fires commands. Only once this is done can the Penetration Division be committed. Penetration as a scheme of maneuver is not possible if the Corps hasn't done its job. This is what Army guys mean when they say set the conditions. It's for this reason that the new division organizations can't be viewed in isolation. The Corps and Joint Levels, which include all branches of service, will be an integral part of success in large-scale conflicts. After breaking through, the Penetration Divisions maneuver in the enemy's rear. This splits the enemy force, allowing them to be defeated in detail, and causes them to reveal more of their artillery and air defenses, which accelerates their destruction. The reason why penetration or going straight through the front is the focus is mainly due to time. If time permitted and the conditions were right, the division could flank the enemy like any other unit. But if the Corps suppressed the enemy's artillery, electronic warfare assets, and air defenses in a specific area, under the Army's current thinking, it creates a closing window of opportunity to maneuver. Applied to Russian thinking, it takes away Russia's ability to turn a fight into an attritional artillery fight on their terms. It's assumed that an advanced enemy will be able to get those systems back up, so taking longer to be less risky may ultimately risk unacceptable casualties from artillery. 
Additionally, against enemies with advanced sensors and good situational awareness, it might be impossible to achieve the operational surprise necessary to make a flank worthwhile. But if a division culminates, meaning no longer able to advance after penetrating but before reaching their objective, they're very vulnerable to flank attacks and fires. Once the division has gotten into the enemy's rear, it can't lose momentum. This means that the Pen Division, in addition to lethality, armor protection, and all that, needs more robust logistics to keep supplied when lines of communication are stretched. The division also needs more engineering support on hand, so if they hit a river or unexpected complex obstacles, they don't have to wait around for core support. And that leads to our final question, how will the new organizations address these roles? There will be three penetration divisions, the active 1st Cavalry and 1st Armored Divisions under 3 Corps, and the National Guard 34th Infantry Division aligned to 5 Corps in Europe. The maneuver force of each division will be three permanent armored brigade combat teams, composed of Abrams tank companies and Bradley infantry companies. Although task organization could see up to two more brigades attached depending on the operation. The three pen divisions will contain half of the army's active ABCTs and three-fifths of the National Guards. Compared to today, the armored brigades will have some assets transferred to division. In Penn Divisions, they'll keep their three Combined Arms Battalions, Engineer Battalion, and Brigade Support Battalion, but their Self-Propelled Artillery Battalion will be transferred to the Division Artillery. Their Brigade Cavalry Squadron, responsible for security and reconnaissance, will also be reduced to an Armored Cavalry Troop, as the Division-level Cavalry Squadron will be returning. A new addition will be a Robot Combat Vehicle Company, equipped with unmanned ground combat vehicles. If adopted, they'll likely provide security on the flanks of convoys and formations, scout high-risk areas without putting lives at risk, and provide limited direct fire support. DivCav, meanwhile, as the division's main reconnaissance and security body providing early warning for the main force, will have three armored cavalry troops. Each troop will have a headquarters section, two armored scout platoons with six Bradleys each, a motorized scout platoon, two tank platoons, a two-tube 120mm mortar section, and a UAV team. The Brigade Cav Troop will look similar, but it'll also have a Chemical Reconnaissance Troop attached from the Brigade Engineer Battalion. The big change is the reintroduction of tanks into the same troops as the Scouts, and doubling the amount of tanks involved. Also coming is the Cross Domain Troop which is functionally a headquarters section and one surveillance platoon manned by 15 series aviation MOSs. This unit has been described by the 1st Cavalry Division Commander as a landing place for new technologies in the division, with one example being drone swarms. The squadron will also have a habitual relationship with one or two troops of air cavalry helicopters and the Combat Aviation Brigade to extend their reach. Over at the Div Arty, their HQ is being worked back up to control the division's artillery battalions. Three of the battalions will be equipped with M109 Paladin 155mm self-propelled cannons, providing direct support to maneuver brigades and the cavalry squadron. The point of centralizing them at division is to allow the division commander to concentrate fires where they're needed. If a brigade is not part of the main effort, they may not need 155mm supporting them all the time. There's an old saying that you should never keep artillery in reserve. It's a better use of resources to task arty in support of brigades committed to the fight. The 4th Battalion, meanwhile, will be equipped with M1299 Extended Range Cannon Artillery, or IRCA, which will provide general support of the whole division thanks to its 70km range. The 1st Cavalry and 1st Armored will receive the first two active duty IRCA battalions, and the current plan is for the 1st Cavalry to activate its IRCA battalion in 2025. Moving on, the Engineering Brigade will offer some unique capabilities to the Penn Division specifically, because no other division has it. They'll have three Engineer Battalions, which between them have five multi-role bridge companies, and seven Armored Combat Engineer Companies. This will triple the amount of Engineer Companies that are in the division currently, and it's all because of the mobility during penetration point that I made earlier. If a division runs into a river, tank ditch, or whatever, the division needs engineers to put up bridges so they can cross it. 
As stated before, slowing down while conducting a penetration can cause the division to fail to reach its objective, so the rationale is divisions tailored to operating in the enemy's rear should have their own organic engineers to solve those problems without having to wait for core support. It could also be argued that if the division has those engineers on hand in garrison, they'd have more training opportunities and be more familiar with the capability. It's a trade-off that'll likely have to be weighed against the cost of manning all those engineers and depriving the Corps commander of the ability to task them as they see fit. The Protection Brigade, meanwhile, is responsible for security in the division's rear area. It's basically an evolution of the separate Maneuver Enhancement Brigades. The units it has aren't radically different from the types of support units that were under divisions before 2005. They'll include an Engineer Battalion, Military Police Battalion, Short Range Air Defense Battalion, a Chemical Defense Battalion, and a Support Battalion to sustain them. If a combat support unit is attached to the division, like additional MPs or an aligned EOD battalion, they'd also likely come under this umbrella. The engineers will most likely be focused on counter-mobility tasks, like setting up obstacles and preparing defensive positions around command posts, preparing CPs, routes, or medical stations via construction, setting up bridging in the rear, and developing a physical understanding of the environment. Basically, one part of rear area mobility and security. MPs, meanwhile, are known for their law enforcement role, base security, and managing prisoners of war. But they also work with movement control units from sustainment brigades to ensure traffic keeps moving along routes, so another piece of mobility. But MPs are also theoretically meant to be able to defeat up to level 2 threats in the rear area, including raids, sabotage, terrorist activity, and special forces action. They're also meant to be able to delay level 3 threats, which includes larger enemy maneuver forces, long enough for a reaction force to arrive and actually repel the threat. Normally that reaction force would be an infantry battalion attached to the protection brigade. MPs are also responsible for conducting reconnaissance in the rear area and screening command posts. This sort of economy of force mission frees up maneuver units to do their thing on the front rather than being tied up guarding the rear. Waypoint divisions have a battalion of MPs as well, while divisions back in 2004 had just a company, which maybe suggests a heavier emphasis on that rear area security. As well, the Division Air Defense Battalion will have a critical role in providing air security in the rear areas of both the divisions and brigades. As currently envisioned, the battalion will have three batteries equipped with a Maneuver Short Range Air Defense System, or M Shorad, based on the Striker, adapted to defeating drones, helicopters, and fixed wing aircraft flying below 3,500 meters. Based on current indications, it seems the battalion will have 36 systems, with 12 M Shorads per battery and 4 per platoon. Increment 1 of the program will be equipped with stingers and a 30mm cannon, increment 2 with a laser system, and increment 3 with a stinger replacement and proximity fuse 30mm. The ultimate goal for the 2030s is for a mix of laser and kinetic M Shorads. The battalion will also have one indirect fire protection capability, or IFPIC battery, which is an Iron Dome type of system designed to defeat subsonic cruise missiles, drones, rocket artillery, mortars, and other air targets. A fifth battery will also be tasked with manning a mix of counter drone systems and act as the subject matter experts on anti drone activities. It could man MLIDs, which includes a 30mm cannon and Coyote Interceptor supported by a radar. One version of the Coyote will be equipped with a warhead for kinetically destroying a drone, while another will be equipped with a high-power microwave for neutralizing drone swarms. Smaller handheld platforms like Drone Buster could also be under the battery's purview. The current goal is to field 9 divisional Shorad battalions increased from the original 4 battalion outlook. These will be earmarked for the three Penn Divisions, the 82nd and 101st Airborne, the 25th Infantry, one aligned to Europe, one aligned to the Indo-Pacific, and one under the 31st ADA Brigade at Fort Sill. The Sustainment Brigade, meanwhile, controls the high-level logistics units that keep the division going. They're flexible HQs that can accept a variety of logistics units. Organically, they have one Special Troops Battalion, which includes stuff like HQ and Signals, and a Division Sustainment Support Battalion, but they can accept up to five more attached combat sustainment support battalions tailored to the environment and needs. 
Each divisional support battalion consists of an HQ, a composite supply company, composite truck company, and a support maintenance company, with the option to attach three additional logistics companies. For First Cavalry Division prior to 2021, these companies were numbered companies. What this meant is Forcecom, which is responsible for generating forces for overseas deployments, could detach support companies and deploy them all over the map to support overseas commitments, leaving the division unsupported. Also, the capabilities of these companies weren't necessarily aligned with their assigned division. They've since changed them from numbered to letter companies, with Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. The intent is for these companies to function as part of their battalion in support of the division. The logisticians were actually ahead of the curve in this regard. They're also handing down new organizations between now and 2025, which will align them more with the needs of the maneuver division. Currently, the composite supply company can lift about 125,000 US gallons or 570,000 liters of fuel with its tankers. This is set to increase to 225,000 gallons or 1 million liters in the active component, excluding National Guard units. Fuel distribution capability is degraded significantly during the global war on terror as the Army contracted a lot of its logistics out. Division fuel capabilities will now be brought up back to pre-BCT levels. Additionally, the battalion's maintenance company will be gaining two additional platoons to make it capable of maintaining Abrams' main battle tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles, which it couldn't do before. Above Division, 3 Corps, which will have both of the active duty Penn Divisions, has reactivated the only active duty Petroleum Support Battalion. These units are critical in the fuel supply process, but they were all made part of the reserve component in 2012. It's likely another move to make the logistics chain more ready with a shorter workup time and less skill loss. Over in the Combat Aviation Brigade, there aren't that many drastic changes. They will be losing their General Support Aviation Battalion with its Command and Medevac Blackhawks and Heavy Lift Chinooks, so aviation can be bolstered in the 101st Airborne Division. They will maintain an Attack Battalion, Attack Recon Squadron, an assault battalion, as well as a company of MQ-1C Grey Eagle drones. The attack and attack recon units are currently equipped with AH-64 Apaches, while assault battalions are Blackhawk equipped. Although the Army plans to cease production of both in the 2020s in favor of the two future vertical lift aircraft, the new platforms won't fully be in service until the 2030s. So that's the Penn Division, but what about the Heavy Division? Heavy divisions look a little less niche, based around two armored BCTs and one striker BCT. There are currently enough brigades to form three active duty heavy divisions and one National Guard heavy division before major reflagging. I don't know if they published a list yet, but the 1st and 4th infantry divisions under 3 Corps and the 3rd infantry under the 18th Airborne Corps seem like prime targets in the active component. Artillery will still be moved to the division level, but not the cavalry. The brigades will still have their cavalry squadron, which could suggest a more independent or dispersed operations than in the Penn Division. Also, unlike in the ABCTs, the Striker BCT will not have an engineer battalion, and the division artillery will not have a general support artillery battalion like in the Penn Division. But core level artillery like Urkas or MLRS can still be attached to these divisions to provide a reinforcing or general support mission. Putting striker brigades with the ABCTs in this sort of arrangement makes sense to me personally. The common argument is that strikers could slow the Abrams and Bradleys down tactically, while the latter slow the strikers down operationally. But the added mobile armored infantry three striker infantry battalions provide may be a welcome boost that adds flexibility to the formation. A little more infantry mass to conduct defensive operations, operate in complex terrain and urban environments where infantry are the focus, and asymmetric operations. The pairing would also likely make the retirement of the Stryker MGS less of an issue, aside from the adoption of the 30mm Stryker, since Stryker units can task force with Abrams tanks in support. In this circumstance, it doesn't really matter if the Strikers have worse cross-country mobility than the Abrams, because the Abrams is enabling the Striker infantry to do their thing and not the other way around. The plentiful Bradleys and the armored BCTs precludes the need for Strikers to support fast-paced Abrams action. In smaller scale and less intense operations, Brigades can also act independently under the Division framework. They just need to be reinforced accordingly. 
This was what was done before the previously ad hoc brigade combat teams were made permanent. The artillery battalion tasked in direct support of the Striker BCT will initially be equipped with the towed 155mm pieces, the M777, but the adoption of a truck-mounted SPG to support the Striker BCTs in the future is possible. Also, rather than having an engineer brigade, the division will have an engineer battalion with five combat engineer companies, which will be standard for all division types except for the Penn Division. But otherwise, the Combat Aviation Brigade, Division Sustainment Brigade, and Protection Brigade are identical. But they will be later to receive key capabilities compared to the Penn Division, such as M. Shorad, if they receive them at all. I'd just like to thank our patrons for protecting Battle Order from the whims of the advertisers. Consider joining them at the link in the description. And to learn more about future U.S. Army developments, check out this video on the Army's future MPF units, Light Tank Battalions supporting the Light Infantry. We'll see you over there.